Thank you. Everyone, please enjoy your dinner.
I do this by creating human capital in the community. This leads to better boards for nonprofits, not just this board, but all nonprofits. More volunteers in this community for the community, and more people working to make this a better place to live and raise a family. Now, this is a small and very efficient nonprofit. And it's important to note that one, I'm not a tax lawyer, but I'm told for certain that 100% of every bit of your contribution tonight will be tax deductible, and they will send you something official for that purpose that should, should keep you out of the sheriff's uh, other, uh, should, should protect you in case, in case of March. And that means that if not now, later, but I think even now you might be ready to support this organization. There is a QR code on your table. And that QR code will let you cut straight through all the red tape that often occurs when you say to yourself, I want to give them money, I want to support them, I want to lift them up, I want to forget about the house payment this month, I want to give it to them. You're sitting there and thinking, why do I need a car? I should help them. So you get that QR code and you plug it in there and you can just, and the bar is still open, okay, which is somewhat part of the idea here. Think about how exuberant and happy that you are. You can do it now. Or you can do it at the end of the program, or you can do it at any time in between. But please consider the importance of this event and this occasion when you come and consider the possibility that you would contribute. Now, I have here a list of elected officials, which is very important. The elected officials, I'm going to name you too, can use that QR code. So many of us have had to contribute to you because we love you so much. There's an opportunity now for you to return that love to us here in Donaldson. Based upon how much love you return, you'll actually get a much larger notice here on the ultimate reports from the organization, uh, which has nothing whatsoever to do uh, with re-election, but they're coming up soon. Vice Mayor Angie Henderson is here with us tonight, as of course is our Sheriff Darren Holt. Brenda Wynn, our County Clerk is here tonight, and she's also involved with the filming. Her family is helping through the Temple Church to film tonight. Councilmember Russ Bradford, Councilmember Aaron Evans, Councilmember Jeff Essick, Councilmember Jeff Gray, Councilmember Delicia Porterfield, Councilmember Jones Toombs, and School Board Representative Athena Nabak are all here tonight. Please join me in thanking you. formally recognize Darren's family. You've already heard about the important anniversary, but I need to please hold your pause so I get through to the end so that there's no sense of more or less importance among the family members. <laughs> Darren's wife Ginger is here, Darren's sons and daughter-in-law, Weston, Dylan, and Dylan's wife, Laura, who I will be introducing in just a moment, and Darren's mother, Gail Hall. All here tonight. Join me. Thank you much. Sheriff's family is here, and those are the employees of the Sheriff's family, uh, me, the Sheriff's department, which he considers family as well. There are quite a number of them. If I could ask the Sheriff's deputies and employees of the Sheriff's department here tonight to stand up, please. And thank you. Thank you. Get this party started. Down, we need you to come to the stage, please. And now I get to welcome Lauren Zapata Hall to talk about family matters. Laura is, and we know this factually, Sheriff Hall's favorite daughter. <laughs> she's his only daughter, so we'll see whether she's still the favorite daughter after this particular interview is complete. Called and said, um, We have a test for you and we want you to roast me. I think that's how it went, right? <laughs> um, you know, um, what he said to me was, Be careful tonight because I know he's in law enforcement, but the person who lays down the law is grandmother. So uh, we need to be careful with the questions we ask tonight. But let's get into this. I'm very excited, mostly because you're nervous. Um, so to know you is to know grandmother. And so, of course, I did the smart thing, and I asked grandmother a couple of questions just to make sure I was on the good side tonight as we get started. And so, one of the 
the questions I asked her was, you know, tell me a little bit about some of the memories. And uh, she said, there's only two times that I can remember him getting in trouble. And I'm not going to put you to the test of those two times. I think we all know, a lot of us here know one of them well, and so I'd love for you to share that. But the second one, I was surprised by because I had never heard it. So um, go ahead and try to guess, or find yourself out. Give me yourself. Go back to number one. Yeah, number one, of course, we can start with number one. And so I really 
didn't remember what the call was, it just delayed the game. And I was in the outfield, so I come walking down to get a coat. I did not remember who was out, who was safe. He was the umpire, and I walked by. My in-laws and my mother, everybody else in the stands were yelling at the umpire for several minutes. I walked by, and I was kind of tired of the game not moving on. I didn't really care, didn't even know what the call was. I just said, can we move on? He said, you're moving on. <laughs> So I didn't even know what I was complaining about, but I blame that on Luke Bryan and <laughs> Shana and Ginger and everybody else. Very interesting, good track record. Um, <laughs> uh, I was going to ask you, but I don't know if we can do this with your mic, um, if you could do your whistle that you did for them to pay attention and maybe give them a little bit of a show. They know I'm going to be here. I just wanted to know I was there. I can, I can try.
and something happened with that toy that was not really good. You want to share a little bit about that? Why am I feeling this way? <laughs> So West was born two months before I was elected, and uh, and and life as we know it, you know, every time I look at him, I go, "I've been this job too long." He's graduated from college, but uh, um, but Weston also was a, was a very colicky baby because we were campaigning the whole time, and um, uh, it, it altered the way that that uh, that we raise a child. I mean, I, I, uh, I was in a political debate the night that he was born. I was in the hospital, saw it happen, take off. Um, uh, and so, in some ways, the whole, to me, the, the role of sheriff is that six foot two kid over there who, who lived this whole time and we grew up, he grew up uh, kind of as we went through this after, uh, you know, after you, you know, um, because they tried to switch me out. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get something out here, right? So, Weston was about three months old. Um, I had just been elected in May, and one of the things that was important to me was I did not want neighbors and people you know, to look at you differently because of the media, the public, the world of getting favoritism or whatever you want to call it. We live on, on the street in the you know, Green Hall area, I guess. And so, been just two months I'm into this term. I'm trying to be calm and quiet and cool. And Ginger and I run around the house, and he was crying about everything. Because he had all this colic stuff, so he just put food in his mouth to give him anything to play with. And so on this day, she's in the shower, and I give him this little box. I don't know what it was. I've never used it, never seen it. We've never touched it in our life. I, I just gave it to him. It so happened to be the alarm system. We, we didn't build the house. <laughs> We don't use the alarm, we don't even set the alarm, and I'm talking about, so this little box did these sound alarms to fire police. Probably the CIA, because by the time you walk out, we had gurneys rolling down the driveway with every street. These people think I'm headed to work. Well, we didn't have any alarms. This is how I go to work now. in your life, and that is Ginger. Um, we uh, celebrated 25 years. Congratulations. Um, that's your silver anniversary, and as you know, for birthdays, we always talk about you know, what's the thing that you are most proud of, and that's what's the thing you're always looking forward to. And so in this context with Ginger, um, do you want to talk to us a little bit about something that um, you're most proud of, and it's a thing you're looking forward to. By the way, it's our 25th. My parents would have been 65th this year. Um, it will be your first this year. So I, I love the symmetry of that. We were in Italy for the wedding. It was fantastic. Um, and, uh, but, but, you know, Ginger, Dylan spoke at, at uh, Ginger's mother's funeral. And I had a rule, I didn't tell you what to say, I don't care, I wanted to speak, you need to do that. And, uh, and he came up with a word for her mother that, and spoke about it, did a great job, about selfless. And that was the word he believed. And I thought, you know, he did a great job, you know, he did. I was, it was emotional, you can watch it right now, it was emotional, it was powerful, it was honest. And then I, I, I realized it's hereditary. And I mean that to the fullest. You, you, you can't imagine Ginger's 34th birthday was my election night. And so instead of celebrating birthdays or celebrating something else, we're killing the votes. Her birthday is the first day of August. For the next 20 years, we were in some city for me. For some job I'm in, mean, for some association I was a part of, and had me traveling all the time. So we celebrate birthdays in every city in the world. And she has ridden in the back seat of this car. Um, and 
Virginia tomorrow. Last night it was your 23rd anniversary. You know what I'm saying? Tomorrow we're headed to Donaldson. <laughs>
Mm-hmm. Past two decades? Yeah. 20 years, 22 years. 22 years. Why do you think? Why? I mean, that, look, first of all, there are a lot of sheriffs who have called me and said, well, how do I get to do that? How do I get to do that? And I go, we've got the top law dog from the largest city in the state, the most important one, and he's willing to come on, so that's just the way it is. But why? Why, you know, did you agree to, you know, take that time once a month out to come on? I ask myself what I heard. <laughs> you have no idea. When he walks in, something's wrong. No, but, but, but I, I do, um, and I've always said this over the years and years ago, there is always confusion about what the sheriff does in Nashville that gives a chance to do some of that. Um, you know, even though Nick is with the media, they're not always clear as exactly what stories we're trying to get out. And I don't mean good or bad, but at least explain it. it gives you a chance to do that. It's not always easy. And, and I, I felt like that's a, a part of the job, take, take the calls as they're coming in. and even weird questions from weird people like you. And, <laughs> I think that's part of it. No, that's it, and that's why we enjoy having you on, because a lot of people, and I'm sure this audience is more aware, but it's, it's different um, for the average person to really understand what a sheriff does, and especially in Metro. Now see, I'm, I'm very clear, I've learned a lot from you. The Sheriff's Department does a lot of important things. That's something I learned from the sheriff's office, sheriff's office. You wouldn't call it a police office, would you? And so I owe you what? Every time I did that live on the air, I owe you a dollar. Like, I've learned. I mean, I, that doesn't count. I was just doing that for that. I have a check written from you because you screwed up the whole year last year. Right? That's true. That's true. I do. And, and you would never, you never called to ask for the mayor's department. No, you're and right. And he, and it really does. That's a pet peeve of yours. It's not. And yet there's other sheriffs around the state that still refer to their place of employment as a department. And they're wrong, aren't they? They are wrong, and so are you. <laughs> I've learned from you. I've learned from you. All right, I, you know, um, okay, do you notice the segment that I'm here is called Arrest the Problem, which is a good phrase of yours, and I think I understand what that refers to. It means something else sometimes when it comes to me. Um, you know, one thing I like to bring up and point out to folks, oftentimes when you come on the show, is I respect what you do, and you are basically the mayor of a very large city, that jail, and you're a heck of an administrator, but you can't arrest me, and you cannot give me a ticket if I speed past you. That's not your job in Davidson County, is it? That's Metro Police Department's job, isn't it? Would I ever bring that up with you on the air? <laughs> sure I did, and you turn red just like this. <laughs> I love doing that. But you really can't. I mean, I can just go speeding right by you and wave and be looking at my cell phone. And you can't do that thing. <laughs> because he doesn't really have arrest powers per se. I mean, you can maybe make a citizen's arrest, right? Is that right or am I wrong? I'm not sure. I'm out of you right now. I know! And here's the thing. I'm an idiot who likes to poke the bear. And you should learn not to do that, right? Because I kept doing it and kept doing it over the years. Just can't give me a ticket, can you? At the end of the day, see a sheriff, can't give me a ticket, can't arrest me. <laughs> and then, Delman and Louise came home to roost. You talk too much. <laughs> you, you said it too many times. So, did it get under your skin, and then you decided you were going to do something about it? <clears throat> he <laughs> has the unique, um, I think, claim to um, one of the, uh, this is Nashville TV history thanks to you. And um, it's something that, thanks to you, if you Google my name, the damn thing comes up. <laughs> okay, let's have a look. Good. Finally got what I deserved. <laughs> I'm gonna let him explain this. <laughs> well, well, it's a while ago. Look, after we ran his mouth, <laughs> this is a lot on the air. No, no, no. no. <laughs> That, uh, for impersonating Hondus Castro. <laughs> so this is again. This is classic. We, um, what? Ah, yeah. I've for, been wait, waiting. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait, we're still on the air here now. You, um, you can call Chip. I want Chip. my lawyer, You can Chip. call Chip your lawyer. He's still right here. Chip your lawyer. We, we will have Chip out. on on the... Uh, wait, I don't believe this. Listen, that, your jail can't hold me. Well, we're gonna, wait, I've got a microphone on. We're going to see. We, your we need jail to get him. cannot hold me. We're, we're going to have him... Uh, 
I'm going to run. I'm going to run. It won't be far. No one from Oregon can run. We saw that in the game. So. We'll have you in, in, in the best, best space available. Watch out for smoke. Hold on to him. Up. Get to the side. Wait, I need someone to, to wipe my nose. It's your face. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm not afraid to say it. Jill can't hold me. Oh, that's it. All right. I need it looks, something it to look eat. It looks like you got I your heel right now. Yep. I'm going to need some julep. You guys have julep? That's, right. that's not authorized. That's not authorized? All right. That was a classic. Oh, boy. Yeah. How did you come up with that? That's just what I got what I deserve. What? It's just smug. So here's the reality of it. His no one who worked for him would even pay his bond or get him out. <laughs> no one who worked for him would even speak for him as do you think we should or shouldn't do this? It was unanimous. So you know, it was the mandate of the citizens to to take in this impersonating a journalist or a person. Or <laughs> but because you wanted to show the footage, what you don't know, and, and, and this is usually off limits, we don't do this, it's, as you well know, it's probably uh, sexual limitations have run out, but yes. uh, we would like for everybody to see maybe what, what the final product looked like, the mugshot that we really never showed. <laughs>
And so what you do eventually is you build a loaf. And so what a loaf is, is what you ate tonight, grind it in a blender and hand it to you in a loaf. So whatever the nutri nutritional or caloric, is that it? Caloric? Keller. 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 Uh, the requirement is, still is there, but it's in a loaf. Believe it or not, this knucklehead wanted me to bring him a loaf. I did it. And he ate it. Yeah. So, but I don't know what was on the menu that day, but what a great, it's cool. It's just a little loaf, and it's everything ground up and baked. <laughs> Anyway, it's just interesting tidbits like that. <laughs> and by the way, by the way, so Deanna, from this, obviously running this tonight, reached out this week and wanted to know if, if Nick had any food allergies. Mm. I said, no, feed him a loaf of anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. Food allergies. But you know, um, and, you know, on a serious note, though, just transition a bit, you talked about how there are inmates that are making julep because of the level of addiction. And that's one thing, over the years, um, one thing I've learned about the sheriff is just how forward thinking he is compared to so many other sheriffs I've dealt with and um, looking at ways to do things better and breaking, you're, you're a very down breaker. And I just want to you know, touch on just how special this jail, the new facility that we have, is and the treatment center that you have and what you've taught me about how um, important that is for hopefully reducing, you know, these folks that are in their release, recommitting and coming back, but treating them. And, and really, you're a leader nationwide in what is being done there. Well, I, I, don't, I don't know about that, but I, but I have been around a long time and watched, and again, many friends that we are kind of the, the police connection for me growing up. I rode around with, with Johnny Wheeler when I was 18 and asked for it for my birthday um, to ride with police officers, and I did that. And I've always been interested in it, but I read the book, Hilder Skelter. When I was 16, and I've always wanted to know why people do what they do. If we can figure out the why, maybe we can do something about it. That's just the bottom line. I'm not saying I know, I'm not saying, but if you don't, if you only want to arrest the person and not the problem, don't second guess why the person goes to And so my focus in, in my lifetime has been trying to arrest the problem. The person's been brought to us via the police or via some other law enforcement agency. So when you have the person, uh, I don't have to like what you allegedly have done. But I do have to accept the fact you're going back. You're going home. You're going back into my community. And so I want them to be better prepared. I want them to have whatever the addiction or the mental health disorder. And, and that's hard to do. It's hard to do. Uh, you know, I say this all the time with police in the room and without. You know, figuring out who did it is not really hard. Most people who are addicted aren't super sophisticated. It's dangerous. Work. Police work is very dangerous. What's hard is to break their addiction. I don't care what you say. If you have anybody in your family addicted to anything, you understand what I'm saying. That is incredibly hard to do. And so, but if you don't get the addiction broken, you're going to back out, she out, and she's going to come back, and he's going to come back. And so, I've just always wanted to take pride in trying to do something while you're here. And it's not soft on pride, I'm not pissing all that. I'm just trying to figure out, well, why don't you break into someone's house? And if you did, and we can do anything about why you want to get in that house, then we're better servants of your money. And I think we're better service for the neighborhood that my kids to grow up in. And so that, that's the reason we're trying to do that. Mental health has, has been a passion of mine for the last 10 years. We're the only modern country in the world that would arrest a naked man in the park. We are. No other modern country in the world would arrest you for that. They would realize if you didn't know to wear clothes, you got to go somewhere to go. We don't have an alternative. And so what we do in our society is we call the police. They do their job. They remove the naked man. Unfortunately, they bring them in places that I work. And most systems like mine hide them from you and believe that the problem is solved because they were convicted for 10 days. And so the reality of that is we've got to redirect our, our community to figure out what do you do for the person who is off the medication for nine months. Arresting them does zero to improve it. So we have an opportunity to facility. Just to go this little leave, we have some great people here and look at Eric Bauer and I won't live long enough to see it solved, but I won't live long enough to see it improved. And, and that's, that's really where we are as a country. We're the only country in the world who does it this way. Yeah. And, and I'm glad people acknowledge it, because I mean, you don't realize just how right that is compared to some of what you see with other offices and departments. And you know, it's, it's 
forward thinking and it, uh, it serves us all better that way. But there's a, a sentiment in society right now where just the rest of lock them up. Boom. And you know, or everyone's angry. Just lock them up. Yeah, it's something bad. It doesn't solve the problem. And, and you are just you know, such a thing I've learned from you so much. You have such an enlightened view on that. So, um, a couple things else, you know, uh, you know, we're not only friends from being on the show together where we talk about all kinds of stuff, but I, I've certainly covered a lot of news stories with, you know, the sheriff's office. And uh, a lot of them stand out. We just touched on a couple before we wrap up, the ones that stand out. There are some very high profile inmates. Um, Perry March case. Um, I don't know how many people are familiar with that. Perry March accused um, of murdering his wife, took off to Mexico, and then there was a plot maybe to, you know, he's finally arrested, brought back to the jail here, and you had a big hand in really the prosecution of him in trying to set up um, an informant, right? Uh, Nathan Ferris had a question mark tattooed on his neck. And uh, do, you, do you remember how that played out? Just, that's kind of interesting stuff behind the scenes, how you can help prosecutors by getting information, by putting someone specific in a cell next to someone they want information from. Yeah, and so most of us that grew up here, so you want to see justice brought forward. I do believe people who do, especially what he was led to have done, is he brought to justice. He avoided that in many ways. Ran to Mexico. Right outside of the United States. The police did an incredible job of getting him brought back, extraditing him back. Uh, but a lot of what happened in that case, he, number one, spoke to loudly on the airplane, if you remember. That was Right, right. That's right. The Great detective. Very, very, very starts some, some opportunities, but what really happens later on is the dad was also arrested. Um, something you never really do in corrections or jail is you don't allow visits between two people who are family or loved ones while both incarcerated unless you want them to be a student. <laughs> and, they were. And, and so we allowed them to do that. And, and, um, and ultimately there was conversations that was had. That between the father and son, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that led to information about all sorts of things. And ultimately, the dad turned on the son and forget all the details of the case. But um, I'm sure this was you one day, but I was so angry because some national, I don't know who Nancy Grace is, I don't like her. Um, <laughs> but she got in this weird, who in the world would let two inmates visit or whatever? Because it sounded bizarre. But, yeah. but the reality is, Perry March's cellmate was a guy named Nathaniel Pierce, who was willing to work with folks and he was able to He wore a wire. He wore a wire and, and he had, you know, Perry talking about all kinds of things. And, um, so, you know, it, it, we're just a little piece of this puzzle of called the criminal justice system and, and I'm all for helping people change their life. I believe in redemption. I believe people should change their lives. But I also believe in accountability. We should hold people accountable who have done crimes that are, um, you know, and, and in this case, he, he clearly was guilty of multiple things, but to prove that, and it wasn't me talking, it was him talking, but we wanted to make sure that we get that information. Did them. you work with the DA on that? And, okay, this is how it is. And it worked out? It, it worked, worked out, yeah. yeah. And, and again, he, I, I mean, you know, I've talked off, I forgot exactly, we went on to be convicted of that, but dad dies, uh, they never found him. In off. federal custody, and they still have never found Janet Marsh. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. There's so many, so many um, cases, stories, I, and then one of the more recent ones, um, you know, I've seen him in a lot of state, you know, nervous, angry, frustrated. But I've never seen such sustained anger and frustration in you than the Alex Friedman case. Um, and I remember being at those news conferences, and, you know, and you, when we see each other, you know, you'll smile, right? But you were just so focused. And then the trial, I mean, I'm going to talk just a little bit about that. Maybe, I don't know, I assume everyone here maybe is familiar with that. If not, a little background. He, well, Planted weapons in the new jail. Yeah, I mean, I, I uh, to me, it's the most significant, significant event in my professional life. Yeah, think about that. And, and I, I have said this without, I'm not trying to dramatize it for the country, but in what I do, it was 9 11 minus the end. You know, I have a thousand employees, I'm responsible for a whole bunch of people, i.e., inmates throughout the year, and we built the facilities $200 million a year. And we spent seven years designing it in a safe and secure way because that's our job. And you know, I fault mayors and council and everybody else for us to have say so and how it should be built and designed because our people know better than most government people what corrections should look like. And, and, uh, and so we fought really hard, worked really hard, we did all sorts of things to build the right facility. And the whole time, maybe for three years, through this person who I knew, uh, 
seen it at one time. <laughs> and we now have uh, Tom Davis, uh, who is our third and final presenter to sort of wrap up, put it all in, in a rather larger perspective. Tom is the Director of Records and Offender Information at the Sheriff's Department. More importantly, Tom and Darren grew up on the same street, and they've known each other since they were a little bit. Tom and Darren will discuss. It's a long way from Bruno. Paris was so nice to you. <laughs> I know what stories I'm going to. Uh, okay, we're going to share everything we have. Laura made you cry first. I'm, so, I'm upset about that. <laughs> so, like I said, as the mayor said, we grew up across the street from each other and on Luna Drive in um, Acretown, Tennessee. And um, Darren was my first friend. I mean, he's the, the, for a few months apart. Um, Tell us a little bit about growing up on Luna Drive. Wow, well, yeah, so we, uh, Luna Drive's only famous thing was Tom Davis was born on it and there was an F-16 crash on that street. Uh, other than that, it was a pretty regular American street and I thought we were the richest people in, in the world, all of us, because we, our, our, we had, you know, was it 1,100 square foot house, I don't know, and, and all of us had the same house. Uh, Tom had a Catholic family, so his house had grow. Um, but but we we had an acre lot. Everybody had the same house, and every day we always ran around. We were all the kids were all in similar value system. Parents. It was sounds silly. It was as close to we were the beaver as as I could imagine. And, and uh, I don't know. Just just uh, I don't see that anymore. You know. This is where I go into what happens in Vegas mode. <coughs> So Gail over here was a she was a neighborhood mom, like she was the mom for everybody in the neighborhood. And so, what do you do to get everybody to come to your house? You build a pool. <laughs> Gail built a pool in our neighborhood. It was magical. Oh my God! Like nobody else had a pool that I knew in, in junior high or any place like that. Um, so we we did a lot of swimming. Um, <laughs> So, have you ever slept in a pool? I can't fire you. <laughs> so, so we had this pool, and if you're whatever age, I swam all the time. His dad was like over a pool somewhere in another part of town. Bill there and swam all the time. We do all the swimming, and so we thought, well, what about 24 hours in the pool? Why don't we just camp out in the water? In a raft. We were in a raft with a towel over us. <laughs> yeah, we were in two different rafts, weren't we? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> two different rafts. <laughs> Good point. Fair vacation. I'm okay with all that. I'm just trying to make sure your raft stays in. That ain't not so But yeah, we were going to camp out in this blow up rafts, and you get down in there and you're going to pull a towel over it, kind of get the roof over your part. Was it a new drive through the <laughs> And so we took off at midnight, one or two in the morning, going to camp out in the pool. That was the thing. And about, I don't know what time it was. The monsoon came. The monsoon came. <laughs> so we had more water in my raft than I did in the pool. Within the next two hours, pouring down, and it was soaked. <coughs> and you could hear Tom and I were scurrying into the house to get away from the, the water that we were sleeping on top of. And we used to ride our bikes when you could ride your bikes around to places and, and did a little bit of foreshadowing. We would ride our bike down Lawland Drive, down to Mill Creek Pond, to, to Mill Creek where what stands right now? Our facilities. We would ride down and go fishing right exactly where the jails are right now. Um, and we, we had no idea. It was a scary, uh, insane place that we would go by. Yeah, so growing up right there on Hardy Place, uh, there had been what, what was defined then as a criminally insane building. Uh, that was the term everyone used. It was officially that, that name. It was right on Harding Place. And so Tom and I could see it from our, basically, our neighborhood. And, you know, we get on the bikes and take off and ride and go run around in the creek and everything. And then now that's where we work. It's, it's where the facilities are. It's the area of town. And, uh, uh, it's 
spent many a day in fear in that place when I was a kid. You know? So most of y'all know Darren, he's a food connoisseur. <laughs> we talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, so, chicken fingers, uh, well before chicken fingers, it was spaghetti. So one, there was one time during Thanksgiving, I had my Thanksgiving dinner and I come across the street, as cold as it could be outside, and there's Gail outside with a grill, cooking a hamburger on <laughs> Thanksgiving for Darren. And I thought, man, that is so weird. And I thought, oh, that is so cool. I just had something called giblets. And I, was, and I wanted to be you that time. I and I cranberry sauce was not my thing. So, some of these are funny, some are pretty sad, but there's one of them that feels pretty pathetic right here. And I'm telling on myself, too. Did you ever go to Opryland a lot when you were a youngster? Did you go with me a lot? Yeah. What was our favorite thing to do? <laughs> there will be some mixed out here. Oh, there's some mixed out here for a lot of things, and, and we're going to apologize later. Yes. So you can tell them, you can tell them. Uh, I'll probably tell them a lot. <laughs> so these two studly 13, 14 year olds would go to Opryland pick up chicks, you know. Um, so we had such bravado that we would get on the Skyliner, you know, the thing that went like that. And so as the girls came by this way, and we're going this way, we're going, hey, wait for us on the other side down there, we'll be down there. They never showed up. They never waited, did they? I think a couple of times maybe they did, and I think we got off and we go, oh my God, what did we do? <laughs> there was not a lot of digits got when we did that. But that was fun. It was fun trying. We were, we were studs for a minute. I hope there's no PETA people in here right now. And there, I hope they don't vote because you know, <laughs> we're talking about your granddaddy's lake house, right? And we used to go there. We had lots of good times. A lot of people in here have been to that place. There's a lot of good memories that we can't talk about. But that was the place where you taught me how to toss a frog. <laughs> Do you remember the frog tossing? With the possible deniability in this. You're not supposed to remember this. <laughs> I'd never tossed a frog before, but we would toss them up in the air and they would stand upside down and they would get unconscious and then they woke up. And, and <laughs> With this wrought iron bench right here, so they'd pick them up unconscious and land on there, and then when they'd wake up, they'd run to the top, and whoever got to the top first won. <laughs> it was busy progress. <laughs> I don't know who taught you how to do that, but that was, that was a lot of fun. Sorry, Peter people. And everybody else was gaining the frogs. Yeah, everybody else was gaining them. We let them live. That's why yeah. we, we didn't like frog legs, did we? So, do you ever remember going to the Nashville uh, Fairground Speedway? Yes. <laughs> so you and I went one time, and is my coming to you? No. Okay. <laughs> it, it's going to come fast here, man. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're coming out of the Nashville Speedway, and we're waiting for a deal to come pick us up, and miraculously, there was a banner that had blown off um, these two boats, and it was just laying there. And uh, so we decided to pull it up and we got in the car and went home with it. And, uh, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> take it home and then he, it, it was in their car. So I, I come over like, the next day or the next day after that. And he's got it rolled out. I think it was about 12 feet long and about three feet tall. And he's got it on his driveway. And he's got two cans of paint. One is black, one is red. And what did you paint on there? <laughs> Four letters. <laughs> I'm, I have two years for my pension, by the way. Jail. So we, 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 we found it. We stole the sign. 
No, we just hang out with it. You've already committed a crime earlier, so I'm good. And back then, the coolest thing you could do was flip it over and spray paint and kiss on it. The pan kiss. Right? So I had this super cool kiss poster that was a Winston race car thing. Welcome race fans on one side. It blew off. And I kept the time out of jail. But then as we hung, he did it and we hung him in his room and it was so big that it went across two walls. <laughs> but what we had to do was take out, take down about 30 pictures that he had cut a Team Beat magazine that had <laughs> his pictures on there and he took over for it. How, how long was that in your room, you think? Wings of pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Not soon enough. Do I have enough sick days? <laughs> okay. It's supposed to be a question form. I wrote a 20 minute dissertation on this, but then they said it was going to be a question form. So, here you go. Have you ever been to a Vanderbilt basketball game? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Who did you go with? Well, I went one time with you. I would never go back with you again. <laughs> so, we were roomies. We were roomies, and they put us in a dorm room in Carmichael Tower where the athletes stayed with a telephone. Because Tom Davis's dad was a basketball coach in the high school. He was a cool dude, so he took care of his son, and I got to ride out and go in the dorm with Tom. We're going to be at this camp. Yeah, and my dad knew all the coaches at Vanderbilt, so we were kind of well-known, right? And I was, you were riding my coattails, man. <laughs> <laughs> and I regret every bit of that. <laughs> so what we decided to do was, um, because it was kind of early and we were bored, we, we called every girl that we knew that would answer the phone. Oh, wait, we're 10. Well, no, we were about 12 or 13. It was a short list. <laughs> we thought it was a long list. But we called everybody, every girl we knew that, that would answer the phone, and then it got too late. Um, and then we thought this would be funny. So we, you said some of these people may be affected. They may be affected by this. So we started calling every, probably half of Nashville. Asking them if they were refrigerated for me. <laughs> if I remember getting that call, it was us. Statue of limitations over. And then it got a little late for that, so we started calling all the businesses in town that we could. We made a phone book in our room, too. And what did we ask them? All I'm saying is, we didn't have these phones that we all had. If we had the phone on the wall, we could use it, and we took advantage of using the time to this all night long. We asked him if they had Prince Albert in a pouch. <laughs> Better let him out, he might smother. Right? Okay, so that wasn't the end of the story. So we, we stayed up pretty late, and then so I'm not really good to get up in the morning, and you aren't either. So next thing we remember, on the door, and it was Coach Lee Fowler, which y'all, if y'all lived here long enough, you know it's him, and he is pissed, because we are late. And this is championship day when our parents get to come, right? They get to come watch us play. We're playing in Memorial Gym. So they have these three uh, courts set up and, and our parents get to come watch us play. And our parents came and they got to watch us. What they watch us do? Running laps. <laughs> we ran laps the whole time while everybody else got to play. So proud, weren't you? Let's <laughs> go. Now, so we went to different high schools, and we never went to the same school, um, but all I remember, like, from your high school uh, time were uh, your eye rock and your, uh, your semi-mullet um, thing with your, and then this. <laughs> this, I don't know if you can see this man told but this was in his pocket at the ready, 24-7. I mean, it was in there. If you saw him at the mall, he had it in there, and boy, <laughs> man. And so those are the things I remember. And then you went to college, and you better be glad I didn't go to college with you because I've heard all those stories, and I probably couldn't repeat with him. But later in my life, I was we were married and having kids, and um, I ran into Don Knock, who was a friend of mine. Some of y'all know Don. And so. I said, hey, Don, how you doing? Good, good. What are you doing to work at the sheriff's office? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Darren, yeah, yeah, he's my buddy. He said, 
But Darren Hall is the smartest man I know. I said, Don, how many people do you know? I said, that frog tossing, high rock driving, pocket comb having Darren Hall. And come full circle. Uh, well, it could have been an uncomfortable conversation, and it kind of was for me. I, I called you, and you just had a picture, and I said, hey, I need a job because for some reason my wife thinks I need family insurance. <laughs> so you, you were gracious, and you said, I don't have anything, but um, I got something coming up. You start at the bottom, and I said, you know, I'm okay. Um, and a few months later, you called, and you made it easy for me. You didn't make it weird or difficult. And, you know, Come to find out later that um, you know you you run the sheriff's office like a Fortune 500 company, like a meritocracy where people can advance if they do their, their best work, right? And that's what you did for me. And so, come to find out that Don was right, and he did. You're forward thinking. You're you always want the best. You never stop until uh, you get what you need for everybody. Um, I had some health issues recently, and you called me. You have a thousand uh, employees, three thousand inmates, a family, and you called me. You came to see me. You texted me, and kind of got on my nerves with what you texted me. But, <laughs> um, but you were always there for me, and, and I appreciate that. Um, so I'm gonna. I got another list of things I want to talk about because he, he won't talk about himself. That's one of the things that, that the humility that he has. But I have a laundry list of things that he has accomplished. And here we go. Some of them we talked about. So at 29, he became the youngest deputy sheriff, the number two person in uh, Davidson County history. At 37, he became the youngest sheriff elected in Nashville, Davidson County. Currently, he's the longest serving sheriff in Nashville. He's the only sheriff from Tennessee to be elected president of NSA which is National Sheriff's Association. He's the only sheriff ever to be elected as the president of the American Correction Association. And he even won their ER CAS award, which is to give it one time a year to one person. And it's their person of the year, and he won that. He's seen as an expert in criminal justice. He's been interviewed by the BBC, NPR, Fox, CNN, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Fortune Magazine, he was a finalist for People Magazine, Sexiest Man Alive. Give <laughs> second. Uh, he runs the most racially diverse agency in metro government. He has the lowest turnover rates, one of the lowest turnover rates in the U.S., which is hard to do these days. He's seen as a visionary in starting such programs as the Behavioral Care Center, STEP, which is a, a program for people who want to retire early. Paul's Mother's and Father's Day Out, Beat of Life, uh, among other things. Uh, you know, life, life is, is pretty ephemeral, and there's not many people that are lucky enough. See, I told you I wanted to make you cry, and you did it first. <laughs> They're lucky enough to have someone in their life like full circle. You know, as a friend, as a mentor, as a boss. And, and I'm lucky to have that. Thank you. 
Yep, you're good. <laughs> okay, so um, before we go on, we got we got something else very special for you tonight. But before we do that, I wanted to talk a minute with you about our missing person tonight. So Miss Phyllis Williams is not able to be with us tonight. She's up in heaven with the biggest smile on her face. She is so happy right now. And we miss her terribly. And she should have been here. And so, Darren, I just wanted to offer you an opportunity to say whatever you'd like to say. Yeah, so uh, 22 years ago, I, I grew up in a little town called Maker Town across Interstate from Donaldson. We were in the neighborhood, really, so I always kind of claimed Donaldson in a lot of ways. But um, when you take off on the journey, as the mayor knows and others have been elected, you, you run all of this through Fox County. And so uh, I meant to shoot you from my name for the school years back, now 23, 24 years ago. Um, I remember going home and telling Ginger, I said, This is the hardest woman to read I've ever met in my life. Because I, I just think she was such an important person, and just, just a really nice human being. And politically, she was very entrenched in what was important for her. And in the scale of importance, she was an important person for some young guy who didn't have a whole lot of people support him. And, uh, and, and she took a risk with me and uh, just, you know, was, was comfortable enough for this unknown person to say, you know, I think this is the right guy. And uh, when no one else was saying that. And I, uh, I just grew incredibly fond of Phyllis Williams. And so as time went on, lucky enough to get elected in large part because of Phyllis and she connected me to many of people in this room and, and other places and um, I, uh, one of the coolest things, I don't remember the timing, but she retired from the old group of credit union and, uh, and so she was without a job at some point, didn't need a job and I said, well, won't you come work for us? I said, you'd be the coolest guy I've ever met. <laughs> and, uh, and she did it. I was so proud to be able to tell Chris what it works for us. I mean, here's a woman who, uh, I mean, and she just jumped in, she might bring this here and, and became just an instant part of, of our family internally. And, and I, I can say this because it was almost like parents bragging about their kids. She's so proud of what we were doing. And if you want to you know, you reach me, man, she was just that. And so everything was going great and life was good. And, Phyllis and Cooper. Uh, she was working with us, and um, you know, and uh, there's a picture that tumbled through here tonight. It's just uh, she was honored somewhere out here. Came out here one night, one of the happiest moments I can still see her. That picture was a fantastic shot, and um, it's just not fair. You know, life's not fair. She was an incredible human being, and and really is what community is supposed to be about. Right? To me. And, uh, and connected us in, in so many different ways. And I, I uh, uh, one of the coolest things I've ever been given until the night, and I mean this because of who's here. Uh, early in my tenure, she nominated me for a thing called the Good Guy Award. Well, I've never been called a good guy in my life. <laughs> and I've got something, and Phyllis was sitting around, you know, this little, little token of, of you're a good guy, I think that's what they call it. And uh, I still hang in my office right now. And I think the end is right. Should be proud. I, I hope. I hope she'd be proud of what we've done, uh, what we're doing. Um, but um, there's a sign hanging out here every morning, and, and uh, intentionally uh, drive. When I drive that road, I just stop, slow down, and just sit there and just stare at that man because it's not enough for who she was. But she stopped a whole bunch of times to do things for me. So, uh, um, <sighs> that was what he was talking about.
you can't have a lot of council people come to an event without bringing a proclamation. And so that's what we're going to do is read your proclamation. And I'm going to do this last section here. So start with John. Whereas Sharon, uh, Sheriff Darren Hall was elected to the sixth term of Davidson County Sheriff in 2022, he made Nashville history by having the youngest, by being the, having the youngest person ever elected to the office and the longest serving. And where Sheriff Hall has made arresting the problem of the person a major focus, he designed and implemented the first of its kind behavioral care center which is a diversion program aimed at decriminalizing mental illness and whereas Sheriff Hall was elected as president of two national associations and is the only Tennessee sheriff to serve as the president of the National Sheriff's Association, he was also elected the 101st president of the American Correctional Association and Brad, Sheriff Hall has won numerous awards, including the prestigious E.R. Cass Award, the highest honor given in the corrections profession, and after 35 years of criminal justice experience, he is considered an expert in the field, whereas... He has been interviewed by national and international media outlets, including the Wall Street Journal, the British Broadcasting Corporation, aka the BBC, NPR, National Public Radio, The New York Times, Fox News, CNN, and Fortune Magazine, and... Whereas, Sheriff Hall is the honoree for the 2024 In My Life of Death, hosted by Elevate, a leadership community, on March 28th, 2024, and... Now, therefore, I, Erin Evans, District 12 Council Member of the Metropolitan Government of Nashville, Davidson County, and also the Public Health and Safety Chair, do hereby honor and recognize Sheriff Darren Hall for his outstanding achievements, relentless passion for criminal justice, and his invaluable contributions to Nashville and Davidson County. He's a, he's a good man. He's a 
great share. Best we ever had. Might be the best we ever will. We were very thankful for it. We really are. And now I need to do the official part of what I'm supposed to be doing. I gave you a little warm up, a little tease for this, so you won't be totally surprised when I say Elevate is a very small nonprofit. <laughs> Words. I think I heard you say it one time, no place I'd rather give money than give. Church, you may have mentioned church. <laughs> you might have mentioned your wife. But after that, this is the place where Baron Hall's heart and his, his treasure. He's an honest man, but it's not, not a lot of treasure, but it's, it's, it's treasure. Anyway, if you haven't taken the opportunity so far, you remember I mentioned the QR code. But for those of you that don't know what a QR code is, you can write a check, you can accept cash. It can be your watch. Anything that you would like to do to advance the work of this organization, the people that have already done that, let me mention them quickly. These are our sponsors for the evening. Our platinum sponsor is BNA, the law office of Jennifer McCoy. Is also a platinum sponsor and the bar sponsor. Many, many of you are more welcome than you should be. Uh, the, the, Wilson, the Wilson Bank and Trust is also a platinum sponsor. HJL Properties is a gold sponsor. All the table hosts, we thank you. Victor Wynn and our friends from the Temple Church for capturing this event on video. Steve Smart, photographer for Elevate, and also Reginald Scott, who takes pictures not only here of you tonight, but also mugshots and other things for the Vincent County <laughs> Sheriff's Department. And I thank everyone who had a hand in making this event. And wasn't it great to see all of those council members here actually happy and together and smiling and working together? I need for the Elevate Board of Directors to stand. Quick. You're good. You're very fast. It's a very fast thing. You're going to recognize the events team, the marketing team, the Elevate, and also the Elevate very supportive alumni base. And we're all the alumni and the current class members of Elevate. Please stay. Okay, everyone be safe going home. Have a nice night. <laughs>